Tonight we're here to pay tribute to Bob Hoover. And first of all, I'd like to thank your host for the evening, Ron Van Fagan. Ron Van, please stand. Ron Van Fagan. And Mr. Paul Wood. Paul, Paul Wood. Tonight we're here in the PAC studio. We've got nearly 500 people here to pay tribute to Bob Hoover. But the fact is that while there are 500 of us here, there are people that we are able to represent that come from various parts. Thank you, Tom. I'm delighted to be here tonight in the company of uh, people I never thought I would uh, run into in my life. I'm, the, the aviation community represented here tonight is uh, um, has been a, a, a joy of my life to get to know uh, the people in this room, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you tonight about uh, about Bob. Um, everybody's all day long done a wonderful job about explaining um, what Bob has brought to our lives. Aviation um, has begun to uh, suffer mightily uh, these days and an awareness and understanding of um, what aviation pioneers exemplified by Mr. Hoover have uh, the value that they have brought to our lives and to this country is uh, something that we have to continue uh, to emphasize and value. And one of the most powerful mediums uh, to make those uh, make those points is the medium of uh, of film. Bob's uh, story is a, is a powerful story. And uh, as, as Tom said, it, uh, it takes, uh, the, the story can take many forms. I've seen Kim's film and I was, I was delighted to be able to be a, a small part of that and it's a wonderful film. The film we're gonna see tonight, um, uh, made by a very talented director named Dan Berman. Um, uh, is is another powerful testament to uh, um, what Bob has done for all of us, for this country, for aviation. I first, I first met uh, Dan Berman when I narrated uh, a film that he made on uh, Sully Sullenberger's uh, adventure uh, called Miracle in the Hudson. I was uh, delighted to be able to be a small part of that. So, um, I just want to say that I'm, uh, I'm honored um, to know Bob Hoover and many of the other people um, in this audience tonight. And I hope you will enjoy seeing this rendition of the accomplishments and the virtue of the life of Mr. R.A. Bob Hoover. Well, that was 
that one. You know, last May, Harrison gave me a call. He said, well, I want you to take a look at an idea. He said, I'd like you to consider producing a documentary about a guy by, by the name of Bob Hoover. I was a kid. I remember seeing Bob Hoover fly, but I thought to myself, holy crap, really? And so I started thinking about it, and he, Harrison asked a very key question. What would you do different with Bob Hoover if you had a chance to produce a documentary? And I thought about it long and hard. Bob's, Bob's career is a storied career. There isn't anybody in this room who probably doesn't know most of the stories about Bob Hoover. If you don't, you will. So the question was, what could we do with Bob that hasn't been done for a while? And I thought, I want to put him behind the controls of an airplane one more time. And I want him to share his vision, his passion, his love of aviation with the rest of the world. So what we did, thanks to Harrison, who brought me into this, into this, this story, and Tom Pobresny, Mike and Maria Herman, a core team whose passion and love for aviation and their particular love of Bob Hoover, what they allowed me to do was to tell that story and to give Bob a platform to, to tell us about his life in aviation. But I'm a documentary producer. And while this is a story about Bob Hoover, it's a story about something else too. It's a story about human spirit. It's a story about passion. And it's a story about doing our jobs. And doing our jobs with the, with the grace and style that makes and defines what Bob has been about all of his life. I realize, though, one of the things that was really interesting is that I got involved with a bunch of aviators. I mean, Bob's an aviator, he's the aviator's aviator, and then there are all these other aviators. And I realized I had a tiger by the tail. Because, I used to produce science and medicine, I've done a lot of that, and I used to think brain surgeons were tough. And then I started working with aviators, and I realized that this world is an entirely different world, it makes brain surgeons look like pussycats. And it took a big team to make this happen. I, this, it, if you like the film, it, it might have had something to do with me. It had a hell of a lot to do with Bob. It had a hell of a lot to do with the people who were behind allowing us to do this. But, you know, that cinematography up there, Stephen Sheridan, who I, I hope, I don't know where you are, but I hope you'll stand up, who was our director of photography. Jason McKinley. Jason McKinley, who is our, avi our, our aviation animation expert, so that he made, made us look good on Brace for Impact. We had Dominic Messenger, our composer, and a whole crew of people who were involved with the production. But there's one person, if this thing looks good, it's because of one person who, who walked into my office six years ago and has been working with me ever since. She started out as a student of mine eight years ago. Megan Chow, would you just come up real quick and take a bow? Because Megan Chow edited this documentary, she produced it with me, and she worked tirelessly around the clock. To make this and then I'll, I'll do a couple final things. What is it, the Emmys? <laughs> Jeez. This is the face of the person who worked alongside and made this possible. But there are just a few other people I want to thank. Jim and Jane Slattery, who we just met for the first time tonight. They kept writing checks to this guy they knew nothing about. They had no idea what the hell I was going to do with this money, but they knew that I was going to do something. And I thank you for your trust in us to make this documentary possible. But 
finally, there are two senior citizens in this, in this auditorium who made my life crazy. Two. Two. One of them happens to be my father, Joe Berman, who's sitting somewhere around here, who kind of told me a long time ago, the world is a big play box, a big sandbox, and you've got to get out there and play with it and make it worth something and make it worthwhile and make every minute count that we do, the things that we do, and make it work. And that was, if, if I... If I did it right, it's because I had this guy behind me pushing me every step of the way. But then there's one other senior citizen in this office, who, in, this, in this theater, who made my life crazy because he insisted on perfection. He insisted on the same precision that he would expect of himself and that he would inspire in all of us to do our very best. His story was huge. Mike Herman warned me that there would be 10 documentaries in this. I didn't believe him at first. Tom Poveresny warned me. He said, Dan, you, how are you going to figure out how to tell this story in an hour's worth of television? When I met Bob Hoover, I figured it out. I met a man who just decided that precision was more important than anything else. If we do our jobs right, we can make it the best we can make it. Thank you, Bob. to make a comment about Jim and James Slattery. When Mike and I went to the airport down in San Diego to start this project, the first person that came on board was Jim Slattery. He's made this all possible. Jim and Jane, thank you for your support. <laughs> now, if the Marines will step forward and bring our honored guest to the front, please. Welcome to the stage, our honored guest, Bob Hoover. scholar from Emory Real University, Jan Bosch. <laughs> We've heard a lot said about Bob tonight, and we'd like to just have brief comments from two people representing the host committee. The first is Herb Keller. Herb, could you join Bob on stage for a few words about Bob? You all know Herb is the founder of Southwest Airlines, an important part of the aviation community. My name is Travel Mr. Benham, Work Southwest. Love you, Herb! Woo! Yeah! <laughs> There's a microphone on the stage there, Herb, for you. Herb, 
you just spend a couple of minutes sharing your thoughts about Bob's accomplishments? You sit down next to Bob over here, and there's a microphone right next to the chair. Oh, okay. <laughs> and there's no smoking. <laughs> Two icons in the state, Chirp Keller and Bob Wolf. One, two, three. That's as high as an Irishman can count. Is that sound? Yeah. Well, one of the things that I'd like to uh, talk about a little bit is, uh, well, first of all, Bob, I'd like to say how honored I am to be up here with you. I feel kind of like... Uh, I guess a little flea on the neck of a Great Dane. Uh, the flea, which is me, is kind of insignificant in and of himself. Uh, but he's very proud of the company he's keeping. Uh, the Great Dane, which in this case is Bob Boober. And uh, I was thinking about Bob earlier today, and I said, you know, if I were half the man uh, that Bob Boober is, uh, I'd be twice the man that my mother tried to make me. Uh, <laughs> you are a fantastic example uh, and an icon in a whole lot of ways, Bob. But I mean, you know, the test pilot, uh, uh, the warrior. Uh, but uh, I think one thing that's kind of overlooked occasionally, if I may say this, is that you have had a tremendous effect on general and commercial aviation. Uh, you see people go to uh, watch Bob's Magic at the shows, and you know what? They wound up buying general aviation airplanes, and they wind up as employees at uh, FBOs, and they wind up working for commercial uh, airlines, and uh, they all want part of the excitement of what Bob uh, has shown them. And so we're very grateful to you, uh, Bob, in the commercial end of it as well as the other end. There is one thing, however, is Sean Tucker here? Yes, sir. Uh, Sean, I hope you don't uh, mind me repeating this, but uh, I did confer with Sean, who is, uh, you know, the second Bob Hoover, and uh, Sean agreed with me that uh, if you, I'm trying to put this delicately, <laughs> if you had to, uh, Spend a little more money on the engine maintenance. <laughs> you wouldn't have to, probably would have avoided all those embarrassing engine off finales <laughs> in your performances. <laughs> Can I have to, to back me up on that? Ah. <laughs> I'm proud to be a friend of yours, Bob, and I think we're all proud of everything that you've done uh, for our country and uh, also. Uh, the marvelous humility and sense of humor uh, that you've maintained throughout your life. We love you. You know, I want to state again what I've said before many times. This room is full of people who have done far more than I've ever done or contributed to aviation. I'm just proud and, and feel so fortunate and lucky that I happen to be up here being honored as you are doing for me tonight. And it's the greatest privilege of my life and I thank everyone having anything to do with this film. I want to thank them so very much for my overbearing attitude during the making of this film by wanting the details to be as accurate as could possibly be. I, I'd like to, I guess I can't apologize because it's water over the dam, but I've been broken up an awful lot of times. Uh, the reason I'm so crippled is that uh, I had to bail out of a I was on the X-1 program, and I was scheduled to fly right after Chuck did. Uh, and I, I would have been like Buzz Aldrin, the second person, but 
It never happened because I had a, an explosion and an engine fire in a new jet I was testing. Chuck and I had additional assignments besides the X-1 program. And uh, it was the first ejection seat we ever had. And uh, I needed to use it. I, I had both fire warning lights on and I, they went out and I just assumed that my fire was gone and I called the control at uh, Mirac before Edwards was named Edwards, and I said, uh, I've got an emergency, I'm going to land on one of the dry lake beds, and it looks like uh, I'll hit the Roseman lake bed, but I'll get there first, and I may not be able to make it out to the Mirrorock lake bed, but I'll take that one, and have the rescue people come and pick me up, because it was isolated, very isolated at that time, and uh, uh, changed my glide soap to a better glide soap, and all of a sudden, I moved the controls back and nothing happened. And I realized pretty quickly that I was completely out of control. The push pull rods to the uh, elevators had failed and burned away. But the tail was still there. And uh, I called the Mayday and I, I said, I'm ejecting. Well, I pulled the next of kin handles. And you had to be in those days in a very rigid position because if not, you were surely going to have a broken neck and if you moved around you could lose a foot or an arm. And when the ejection seat didn't go, when I squeezed the triggers, uh, I finally decided, boy, you're going to have to make a quick decision here when the airplane was building up speed. And as I say, it was a new jet and I hit 500 miles an hour going straight down. And I was scared to move for fear I'd lose my arm because I had to go to the manual control for jettisoning the canopy. So I unfastened my safety belt, grabbed at the handle, and when I pulled, I went with the canopy and I hit the horizontal stabilizer with the back side of my knees. And it broke both legs through here, and uh, that's why I'm crippled. And my face went into my knees I had my oxygen mask on and a crash helmet, and it took most of the blow out of it. I wouldn't be talking to you now. But I came to and I was free falling, and I'd been above 40,000 feet. I was about 43, as I recall. And uh, I don't know what time I got out of it, but it was, it was, it was later than that, so I must have been around, around 40 or less, and going straight down. Well, when I hit that tail, I was unconscious, and I... Uh, cleared up and uh, with consciousness and I was feeling from my face I looked up and my hands were just covered with blood when I touched my face because I lost both the helmet and oxygen mask after I hit my knees with, but thank goodness I had them on until I hit my knees and uh, from that point on I looked down and I saw my legs just swagging around and I thought oh boy I've had a land and his parachute on two broken legs. And the pain was excruciating, excruciating. And uh, it was in the winter time, and I, at the two points in the story, I, I got on the lake bed, and not the lake bed, but the, the uh, desert floor there, and the parachute, the wind was blowing 25 knots, and the airplanes crashed 25 miles away. I'd been blown that far from where I left the airplane until it, it crashed straight down and I had drifted 25 miles away. Well, they heard my mayday and they had airplanes circling and the smoke caught him coming up and I could see it uh, in, in spite of my injuries. And uh, there I lay out in the cold desert floor in the first part of November. And uh, I thought, well, I'll not survive the night because I looked at my legs and uh, my, everything was black from my knees down and uh, it took the parachute uh, I'd say several several hundred feet to spill because I had to wait until it hit some sagebrush because I couldn't spill it uh, trying to pull the lanyards down to make it collapse the wind was so strong uh -huh. Well, a, a farmer Hello, Bob. who had washed out of, not washed out of, so the war ended and they released everybody and he had 
finally a training, and he was clearing off what Alabama wheel, uh, six ways where they run these wheels around and water it after they uh, plow and get them ready for uh, Alfalfa growth. And uh, he was he was doing that, and he had to look up because of his interest in aviation, and he saw the airplane on fire, and then he saw the he saw the parachute. And he spent hours searching on that desert for me before he found me. But fortunately, he did. Uh, and that was the end of the story there, except that I ended up that night in the hospital. And this is a part of the story I think you'll all get a bit kicked out of. <laughs> they, had, they had both bags up like this in the cast. And I looked down at my feet. And Colleen and I had just been married about a month or two. And I was reading up on this new test I was going to run, which the accident occurred on. And I didn't know it, and she was fiddling around with my feet, just like two recently married people would, have, would act, I would think. <laughs> and she put red fingernail polish on my toes. And so I got on, got dressed the next morning, and, and here I am now. I'm in the hospital with my feet up, and my toenails are bright red sticking out of the chest. And I think they thought, this is the, well, really, you think he is? And I'm not. Okay, Bob, we got some other people who want to tell you, talk to you. But they told my sweetheart. <laughs> I first found out that I had a trouble. Huh? You want to go to the bar tonight? Yeah. <laughs> I bet you shut up. Uh, please excuse me. I'm sorry for being so long. <laughs> around when Bob calls me at home and wants to ask a question. <laughs> Bob, one of the things that we've done to perpetuate your legacy and inspire future generations is establish the Hoover Hall of Honor, which recognizes eight individuals whose accomplishments you respect and admire. At this time, I'd like to ask Sully Sullenberger to come forth to introduce the Hoover Hall of Honor inductees. Your reference here to a miracle on the Hudson, but Sully is an Air Force pilot, airline pilot, but more importantly, someone who's spent his whole life focused on safety. He's been given the opportunity the way he accomplished to promote that vision and safety and flying. And we're very proud that Sully introduced the overall of honor inductees for 2013. Sully? Well, thank you, Tom, for your kind words and your wonderful introduction. And Bob, let me just tell you what an honor it is for me to have even a small part in your memorial service tonight. <laughs> uh, I want to tell you... Okay. <laughs> I just want to tell you that I'm, I'm so honored to have you in a very small part in your service tonight, and that all of us are very glad that you were able to attend. Is that that? <laughs> an important job, and that's reading the names of the Hoover's Hall of Honor inductees. And these are the people who not only have inspired you and me, but who have risen to the level to be able to impress the likes of Robert A. Bob Hoover. And as I read and announce each inductee's name, I'm going to try to voice, in Bob's words, why these people are important to him. Neil Armstrong. And Bob... I'm going to try to do justice to your words. Neil was a very unassuming person to the point of being humble. But as a test pilot, 
He had the courage of a lion. He was calm in the cockpit, and everything he did was at a high level of professionalism. The test data he provided after every flight was always precise. Lee Atwood. Lee was one of the greatest engineers I ever met. He set more he world records than any other pilot, man or woman. She had the aggressive attitude of a tiger in the cockpit and was able to fly a wide variety of airplanes, such as the challenging Lockheed F-104. She inspired many women to fly. General James H. Doolittle. Before I ever met him, I always had General Doolittle on a pedestal. After our first meeting, we developed a mutual respect for each other that led to a warm and personal relationship. My respect for him is based on his depth of knowledge, creative and innovative mind, great leadership skills, and outstanding skills in the cockpit. Drury Wood Jr. As a fellow test pilot, I always admired Drury. He accepted the challenges of high-risk test programs and went about his business without bravado, but with a high level of professionalism. Drury, would you join me on the stage, please? Rutan. What impresses me the most about Bert is his ability to think outside the box when it comes to aircraft design. As an example of this is the Voyager. It is hard to imagine an airplane that could fly non-stop around the world on one tank of fuel. Passion describes his approach to aircraft design. He is always willing to share his engineering knowledge with aviation enthusiasts and students. Bert, would you join us up here, please? And Bob, I'm working quickly to try to get us all to the bar. <laughs> Dick Rutan. One of Dick's outstanding qualities, which I respect, is his willingness to take on flight test programs for futuristic designs, such as the Pond Racer and the Voyager. He accomplished the last real first in aviation by flying around the world nonstop on one tank of gas. That was a test of human endurance and piloting skills. In addition to being a great test pilot and fighter pilot, He's also an outstanding communicator. Gene Cernan. Gene has always been determined to be the best, approaching each assignment with tenacity and focus. What impresses me about Gene is his communication skills and charisma. That combined with his astronaut background, and the fact that he was the last man on the moon makes him a great inspirational speaker. <laughs> and those are the eight inductees to the Hoover's Hall. Say a few words on behalf of all the inductees regarding their honor. Members of the Hoover Hall of Honor. Can you all hear me? Yeah. I have uh, been given the privilege of responding for my colleagues, those of us who are here and those of us who are no longer with us. Uh, uh, in 
and saying thank you. Thank you, Bob Uber, for the opportunity and for your selection to, for us to be the first of those in the R.A. Bob Uber Hall of Honor. Just say a couple words, because I'm not going to keep this from a bar either. <laughs> but you said something at lunch today. You said, but I didn't do it alone. I had a lot of help from a lot of people. There's a saying I know you, you've all heard, and it's standing on the shoulders of giants. Everyone on this stage, everyone selected for this Hall of Honor, I can't help but believe, but everyone in this room, at one time in their aviation career, stood on the shoulders of giants. Shoulders who designed the spacecraft and the systems and the machines that allowed us the privilege and the opportunity to do what we have done. And there's another set of shoulders. It's those shoulders that made us the people we are, developed a passion. As, as you heard about the, the passion to fly, the, those shoulders who allowed us to understand what commitment really was, really is, and what the value of flying is really all about. And shoulders that reminded us, yes, we didn't do it alone. And there was a lady in all of our lives, a lady who has not been mentioned too often here this weekend, and that's Colleen. And we all know that Colleen is one, is, is one of those people, or a set of those shoulders that allowed Bob Hoover to accomplish so much of what he accomplished. You are a legacy, a legacy that will outlive all of us in this room today. Uh, a legacy that I, I, I've heard you say it before, and I'll say it for you now. You have always urged young people who followed in your footsteps to literally always shoot for the moon. But you reminded them that even if they miss, they will land somewhere among the stars. And I think that's the real legacy of Bob Hoover. Following his footsteps, shoulders that are broad and tall, shoulders that carry between them a heart of gold. And that's the Bob Hoover, and that's the honor that we all share with you tonight, Bob. So I just want to thank on behalf of all of us on this stage, all of us who have come and gone before us, it is a tremendous honor, a rare privilege, and it's sincerely humble to be the first inductees of the R.A. Bob Hoover Hall of Honor. We love you, we respect you, and we hold you dear to our hearts. God bless. Thank you, gentlemen. This time, I'd like to ask Dr. Ri Dr. Richard Heist and Dr. Frank Ayers from the Emory Riddle Daytona Prescott campus to come forward, please. Gentlemen, come off the stage. Hall of Honor, accessible 24-7. But since then, we've determined that the perfect fit for a home for the Hoover Hall of Honor is Emory Riddle Aeronautical University. They hosted the dinner last night for Hoover's Heroes. And that they'll utilize this hall of honor to inspire future generations. And with Dr. Heist here and Dr. Ayers, on behalf of the tribute to Bob Hoover, before I do this, I'd like to have Ron Fagan and Mike Kerman join me up here, please. Mike, Ron, please join me up here. As you know, Ron and Mike were organizers of this event.
Marxist, environmental inspiring future generations. On behalf of the tribute to Bob Hoover, we are pleased to present the Ember Riddle tonight. Scholarships to both the Daytona campus and the Prescott campus, the amount of $25,000 per scholarship, and directly to the Hoover Hall of Honor, hopefully the first of many scholarships that come on behalf of the Hoover Hall of Honor. Gentlemen, we are pleased to present you tonight with $25,000 per student scholarships for recognizing Bob Hoover. First of all, I'd like to share with you what an honor it is for every riddle to actually be the host of the Bob Hoover Hall of Honor. We're proud to host it, and we'll host it proudly. After all, Gene Cernan said yesterday, it's all about the kids, and it is. It's all about the students. They're the future of our industry. They're the ones that are going to carry forth the legacy that we're talking about today. And scholarships like this are so important to make this happen. It's important so these kids can realize their dream. They can realize and build the passion and nurture what it takes to be the leaders in our industry tomorrow. And perhaps most importantly, to inspire these students to achieve the vision that Bob Hoover has laid before us. Thank you. Mr. Hoover, for those of us who have aspired to live a life in the air, you have defined the word pilot. You have defined the word courage. And over the last couple days, we've really begun to understand how you have defined a life well lived of dignity, honor, and humility. Those are the values that the students who have attended tonight from the universities, colleges, and high schools need to have out in front of them as they go on to their lives in the air. At Ember Riddle, we're a university that is devoted to helping young people achieving that dream of living a life in aviation. So we are so pleased to be able to host the Hall of Honor and that students from our university will attend with financial backing in your name and they will be going to school on behalf of you. And that's such a, a privilege, I think, for our university. And I would close with the thought that, for all of us, that as the Hoover Hall of Honor and the memorabilia from uh, Mr. Hoover's life is displayed in our flight operations centers, pilots at Ember Riddle, who show up like pilots have for the last 100 years, to base operations or to flight operations and pick up their aircraft, brief their missions, talk to their instructors, will be surrounded by the legacy of Mr. Ari Bob Hoover. And I can think of no better way to start your aviation career than by your example, sir. So on behalf of the Embryo family, we're just simply proud and pleased to be a part of this evening and to be a small part of remembering all we've learned about the last couple days. So thank you all, and God bless you. But the recognition of Bob hasn't stopped there. Recently, a, the Hoover Award was established in honor of Bob and will be at the National Air and Space Museum. If you'd like to make a contribution to support that award, I'd like to ask Pete Bunce and Greg Harris to come forward. On behalf of the tribute to Bob Hoover, We'd like to contribute $10,000 to support the, this award and hope that it provides you with the seed funding to make this grow quickly and promptly to ensure that Bob's legacy is preserved at the National Air Space Museum. Pete, would you like to speak on behalf of you? Thank you, Tom. Well, Bob heard this announcement uh, at uh, Clay and Bruce's and Joe's party right before the Legends event. But we had the opportunity to be able to talk about something where all great ideas are spawned, and that's after having a few whiskeys with Bob at Oshkosh, where we sat down and we said, okay, how do we carry on this inspiration that we've all just appreciated so much from Bob? And we said, a hundred years from now, when we're all gone, how do we carry on and be able to tell that future generation that are going to be flying hypersonic vehicles and going to the stars, how are we going to tell them about this guy? How are we going to tell them what he all meant to us? Say, so, well, the best way 
is when they're sitting there at the National Air and Space Museum, whether it's at the Downtown Museum or at the Udvar Hazi, we want them to be able to go up and know about this man. Be able to go not only and look at his aircraft that's so proudly on display, but to be able to see a statue of him, but then have a winner each and every year whose name is placed on that trophy, looking up at a statue, a bronze of, of Bob, a life-size bronze, and be able to know what he did for all of us and continues to do for, for generations. So be able to have this in perpetuity. We also want to put a time capsule in the base of this that those that contribute to this er effort will be able to write down their feelings about what Bob did and how he inspired them to be open 100 years from now. We have no better supporter than General Jack Daly. We have a, a, a 501c3 that Greg Herrick set up for the National Air Tour a few years ago. So the Aviation Foundation of America is already set up. And so we're gonna go on this effort, try to wrap it up as soon as possible, start the forging process, and have Bob there in the NASM when General Daly makes this go through all the bureaucratic processes needed with all of his curating team. So we hope that you'll be able to support this effort and we're very appreciative of this first donation. Tom and Mike, thank you very much. Right. Well, I think you summed it up well, Pete. The, the bottom line is we all love Bob and uh, we'd like to uh, to share you with all, with the millions of people that visit the National Air and Space Museum. That's part of telling your story. So thank you, Bob. And we all plan on being there 100 years from now when you open that capsule. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask the Marine contingent to join us on the stage. And as they're coming up here, we talked about Colleen Hoover tonight. And she could not be with us. But Bob's son, Rob, and his family is with us, are with us. Bob Hoover and your wife and children, could you come up here and join us, Rob? Rob Hoover? I met Rob for the first time just a few weeks ago, and we wanted to have Rob here tonight to be part of the program to honor his father and his mother. And Rob, as we conclude the program, would you say a few words on behalf of your family regarding your father and his accomplishments? First of all, I'd like to thank everybody for being here and attending this wonderful event and supporting a great career. And I'll keep it real short because I know it's getting late, but um, people always ask me, you know, do you fly? And the answer is no, because it's an almost impossible act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> so, so with that, I say thank you for being a dad and doing what you did, and you've been a wonderful influence on all of us, and we appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you. Bob, our, our message tonight is that I hope that in a small way this has demonstrated to you and your family the great love and appreciation that we have for your dad and your mom, and what they've contributed and accomplished over the decades of service aviation. We've heard, we've heard tonight the last couple of days words precision, commitment, focus, passion, respect. Sometimes they're words that are just spoken. But they're more than words. They're attributes that contribute to success. And they're the attributes that describe Bob Hoover. We're so proud that we can honor you tonight, Bob. And we salute you, Bob Hoover. Bob, um, thank you. We want to tip our hats to you, Bob, tonight. Absolutely. Bob, we tip our hat to you. Has anybody got an extra hat for Bob? <laughs> we tip our hats to you, Bob. There are 500 Panama hats here with 500 congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, please join us in the floor seat if you'd like to for an afterglow that will take place following this event. A chance to honor Bob. Bob, I'm going to take a chance. 
say a few words of thanks to everybody. I'm going to take a chance. <laughs> Thank you. 